Okay, welcome to lecture 11 of CST 3205. In this lecture, I'm going to be covering uh, Vue.js. So, at the beginning of this lecture, I'm going to introduce um, a, couple of, a couple of what are called software design patterns or architectural design patterns, um, which are a way of designing software so you separate the data or the model in the software um, from the view of that data to avoid, you know, certain kinds of common, it's a sort of common mistake to mix them up. And so people have ways of designing software that avoids uh, mixing up the model and the view. And these are the sort of model view controller or the model view view model uh, sort of way of arc software design patterns. Next, I'm going to cover how the couple of JavaScript frameworks that implement or are based on this model view controller or model view view model uh, architectural design frameworks. Um, then I'm going to introduce Vue, which is one of these things, which is like the Vue model in this one. So after I've introduced Vue, giving you some basic usage of Vue, I'll explain uh, briefly, do a little bit of a diversion onto Axios, which is an alternative to using XML HTTP request in the browser. It's a little bit, you know, easier to use and, you know, less sort of clunky than the XML HTTP request for doing Ajax stuff, Ajax communication with the server. Then I'll end up with a, a sort of complete example showing you how you can link the web service that I gave you in the previous lecture, um, the RESTful Serials web service. Um, so I'll show you how you can in, use Vue to display the data that you pull from that web service. So we're going to use Axios to pull the data from that web service and then we're going to display it with Vue. And I hope I'll convince you with this example that Vue does a brilliant job of, uh, you know, uh, displaying that data in such a simple way. Okay, it's such so little code to do so much um, if we combine view with this web service stuff. Finally, uh, last part of this lecture, I'm going to talk about routing. So view and other other sort of similar frameworks uh, typically have some kind of routing mechanism. So I'm going to give a very simple work through example with uh, view routing, um, but you know it's only to ex give you the basic principles if you're building a single page web application. Um, it's not particularly you know comprehensive or good example, I don't think. Right, so model and view. So, what you might do um, when you're writing uh, code um, is to sort of mix up the data um, with the presentation of the data. And you can obviously do this in sort of various different kinds of ways. The data, you might say, well, the data is the database, and then the presentation of the data is sort of, you know, some PHP code that sort of wraps it in HTML tags or something like that. Or you might say, well, the data is a bit sort of more, more of an abstract view of the data, not just the database, but some sort of way in which the database is sort of, you know, currently, um, way in which the data is currently being actively used by your, activation, by your application with the database just being a way of storing it. Um, so however you see the data, um, one common mistake people often make is to actually mix up this data uh, with the presentation to the data. So you could write some super horrible code that had a bunch of sort of SQL statements sort of mixed in with a bunch of uh, sort of code that sort of, you know, put the data from the SQL statements into, dumped it into some kind of, uh, you know, graphical bits like text boxes and all that kind of stuff. You could write some a really horrendous JavaFX application, for example, that mixed up the data with the presentation of the data. But if you're mixing up the presentation of data with the data itself, um, you're going to have a couple of problems. Yeah. Um, suppose you want to change the way the data is implemented. Yeah. So suppose we write this horrendous JavaFX application um, in which we've got SQL statements mixed up with, uh, you know, the actual JavaFX um, GUI bits, um, and then we want to change it to a MongoDB database, for example. Then we're going to have to rewrite the entire application if we want to change the way the data is implemented, um, because our data is sort of mixed up um, with our visualization code. And the same is going to happen if we change the way the data is presented. Yeah, if we want to show a different view of the data or you know present the data in a different way, again we're going to have to mess around with all the application data, uh, with the actual model part of the application as well as with the part with the view part of the application. And modern web web sort of uh, companies, so to speak. Um, typically present their data in lots of different ways and lots of different formats, right? So you might have um, your sort of back-end server, but then that's the data or the model in that server is then going to be presented through an application, through, you know, a website, maybe through a RESTful web service, and maybe, several, or maybe in the company intranet as well, through a CMS or something like that. So there's lots of different ways in which it, employees and customers are going to be viewing that data. And if you mix up the data with the view, again, you're going to have a real struggle to present that data in different ways to different people. 
And of course, it's going to be hard to unit test code written this way. Ideally, you're going to have you know a way of uh, unit testing the model or the data part of your application, and then a separate way of testing the sort of front end functionality that interacts with that model. Okay, so. In general, um, you want to be able to separate the data or the model in your application from the views of that data. That's the sort of, and these are the reasons. So here we come to software design patterns. So there's sort of various recommended ways in which you can design software that can avoid this type of problem. No doubt, you know, there are software design patterns for all kinds of things, but I'm not a, you know, software architect, right? It's not my area of expertise. Um, but the one I'm going to present in this lecture um, are a couple of common patterns that we use in web development or QE development more generally, more generally are this kind of model view controller software design pattern and the model view view model uh, design pattern. So if we use one of these patterns, um, or maybe there's other ones as well, we can actually avoid, we can design an application that's more maintainable, more flexible, and, you know, uh, more testable. And because these, these frameworks are kind of, these patterns are considered to be valuable. People spend an awful lot of time and effort building JavaScript frameworks that support part or all of one of these design patterns. So first one I'm going to briefly mention, not in great deal of detail, is the model view controller one. So here we've got uh, three parts. Yeah? We've got the, the model, and this is the part of the system that holds the data. So it's not necessarily the part that stores the data long term, right? So the database might hold like one sort of snapshot of the data, for example, we might have a file that holds a snapshot of the data, but the models are sort of the active part of the data, which might have been modified or whatever, it might, be the, might be the part sort of sitting in memory or something like that. So it's not necessarily a database. It might be the database, it might be a cache of the database, or it might be something that's a bit more kind of codey or object oriented or something like that, yeah? So it's part of the system that holds the, but that's what was meant by the data in this case. It's not just simply, you know, the, you know a file, yeah? And then we've got the visualization of the data in the model, yeah? And that's what's called the view. And the generally, uh, multiple views of the same data are possible. That's the whole point of having this kind of architecture. And then to sort of stitch the two together, we have the controller, which controls the data flow into the model and update the, it's the view whenever the model changes. That's the idea. So we can separate this uh, application into these three things. And a lot of... Um, sort of frameworks, you know, within, within other programming languages support this model view controller architecture. So I've written quite a lot of code in Qt, which is like a C++ library, um, and that's based on this model view controller stuff. And I bet you there's a sort of Java approach that's based on this as well. So here's the idea. Um, we've got these three things. We've got this model, which is our active data, should we call it, yeah, to separate it from the data in the database, or though it might be the data in the database. And then we've got a view, which is kind of what the user sees in, in, our, in our web stuff. You know, this will be the sort of browser front, the stuff you see in the browser. And then the model, when the, cha when the model changes, um, it updates the view here, yeah? Now the user's looking at the view, looking at the browser. He's seeing that stuff, the, the present, the view of the model. And then he's interacting with these controllers. He might be clicking on buttons, mouse events, all, this, all that stuff. And these controllers have specified ways in which they manipulate or change the model. So the controller's changing the model. When the model changes, it updates the view. And the views and the user's kind of in the loop there, seeing the thing and interacting um, with the controllers. Yeah? So this is the model view controller architecture. And then kind of similar, but you know, a little bit slightly different as well. Um, we've got this model view view model, in which case we've got the model and the view are almost identical. So we've got this sort of active data, sort of the model, the pilot system that holds that data, the active data. And then we've got the view, which is again a visualization of data in the model. Again, multiple views of the same data are possible. But instead of the controller, we've got what's called a view model, which is a sort of intermediate um, module, I suppose you could call it. Um, that kind of maps between model and view. That's what the view model does. So it transforms data from the model to the view and from the view and enables the view to interact with the model. It's a sort of two-way module that does the mapping between module and view. Model and view, sorry. So again, we say here the view and the model are kind of the same as in the MVC architecture. But in this case, we have a sort of, instead of a controller, we have what's called a view model that specifies, that has a bunch of data bindings and commands uh, so that when we interact, when the user interacts with the view, it'll send, you know, data commands to the view model, and then that will update the model. 
When the model changes, it'll send notifications to the view model, and then there'll have specific, specific ways in which the view model can communicate with the view and update the view, yeah? So this provides this kind of binding um, between view and model. And uh, obviously if we have different views, we're probably going to set up different view models to provide the bindings between these different views and a single model. So both model view controller and model view view model seem to be pretty sensible choices for building software. As I said, I'm no, you know, all singing, dancing, software engineer type person, right? I'm not a software architect. Um, no doubt people sit around, you know, conferences arguing the pros and cons of each approach. But they appear to be both fairly solidly grounded, you know, in experience and, you know, it, people, people who understand these things spend a lot of time worrying about that. And these seem to have both, both, these, both of these approaches have their supporters, yeah? Both are used in industry. So in some cases, you know, if you're doing a greenfield project and you're leading that project, you might have, and you are kind of free in terms of the technologies that you can use, then you might have some kind of choice about whether you use a model view controller or a model view view model. In that case, do some research, pick the one that's most appropriate for your application. There may be, you know, compelling reasons for using a model view controller instead of a model view view model. But bear in mind that these kind of arguments about MVC or MVVM are kind of academic a lot of the time, right? Because most of the time you don't have a choice, yeah? So, um, you know, if you're using QT, you know, maybe QT, I have no idea if it supports MVVM, but I know it supports MVC. You might be using a library that only supports one of these approaches because that's the best library for all kinds of other reasons, yeah? You might be working in a company that's using a particular framework based on MVC. So, you know, worrying about this choice is completely irrelevant because you basically got to use uh, the one that's in the company already, yeah? So most of the time you don't have a choice. Uh, if you do have a choice, do some research. So, I've introduced this MVC, MVVM uh, distinction uh, and why we want to go with at least one of these approaches. Now I'm going to talk about some of the JavaScript frameworks that are based on this kind of approach. So several fra JavaScript frameworks are built around the MVC or MVVM patterns. So we've got Angular and Ember. So I've got a hunch, um, but don't take this as you know completely true, um, that both of these are implement all parts of the MVC, okay? But I need to, you know, I'm no Angular Ember expert, so that, that's just a hunch, yeah? Now React um, is, is supposedly the view in the model view controller, okay? And then view, um, which I'm gonna focus on in this lecture, is the view model in model view view model, yeah? It's the, it provides the binding between data, which you know you typically manipulate in some other way in your, in your web app, and the view which is provided you know with just the sort of HTML and CSS stuff. React is the glue, the view model um, between the model and the view in your web application. There's several others. There's, you know this is only a very introductory lecture to all this kind of stuff. The thing to bear in mind, the thing I want you to take home from this slide is that all of these frameworks are inspired to a greater or lesser extent to one of by one of these uh, software design patterns. So, how do we pick the JavaScript framework? You know, we're not going to bother, we're not going to have a JavaScript uh, web page application that uses all four of these libraries because that'd be crazy, stupid, pointless, and would achieve nothing, yeah? We've got to make a choice about the JavaScript framework that we want to use. Now, as you're probably aware by now, having, you know, done this stuff for at least, at least a year and a bit, right? There's a huge number of JavaScript libraries and frameworks. Yeah, every day someone's writing a new one. It's an incredibly dynamic environment, yeah? What you're also probably starting to become aware of is that many frameworks are doing exactly the same thing in slightly different ways. Each company goes off and builds its own, you know, custom JavaScript framework for doing this or that. And then, you know, if they're feeling, you know, kind-hearted, they'll release that framework as some kind of project and then people start using it in the wider world. Um, but a lot of these frameworks are built by companies to do roughly the same kind of thing, but just with a few tweaks based upon what they want, you know, for their particular company. So, so, th so just because it's a different framework doesn't mean it's got some unique and amazing qualities, yeah? And as, if you keep an eye on the sort of state of JavaScript surveys or some of these other surveys that are done on what, what developers are using year by year, you'll see that the popularity of libraries of frameworks is changing all the time, yeah? So one year, you know, one kind of framework might be trendy, another year, another framework will be trendy. It changes on a much faster time scale than a lot of other sort of technolog technological environments. Bear in mind also um, that you're you know, when you start working, right, the company that you work for might not use a particular framework. You might be you know, called in as a sort of JavaScript engineer of some kind, JavaScript developer, 
and you might just have, and you're probably just going to have to work with whatever framework the company happens to have picked, you know, 20 years ago, yeah? So when I worked at Trinity Mirror, they were using cold fusion, yeah? It's a horrendous technology, okay? It couldn't stand cold fusion. Um, but because the company picked that, made that choice, you know, years before I actually joined it, um, I was stuck with writing endless amounts of cold fusion code. So, you know, most of the time you don't really have a choice about a JavaScript framework or any kind of other technological framework. But if you're going to take JavaScript seriously as part of your sort of uh, career in technology, um, my personal recommendation would be not to commit yourself to a single framework, yeah, because frameworks changing all the time, yeah, there's going to be a new one next Tuesday, and so if you just, you know, spend your life just learning every tiny little detail of one framework because you think it's going to be there for life, then you're probably, you know, committing yourself to some kind of delusion, yeah. If you're working in JavaScript, be prepared to move between frameworks and quickly learn new ones. That's the important thing. You've got to have a sort of agile approach to this kind of thing, yeah, because frameworks change all the time and there's nothing that special about any one of them. What I do recommend you do is try to learn the core concepts behind the more popular frameworks. So in this lecture, I'm trying to present uh, the view, right? It's a lecture on view mainly, um, but I hope by understanding how view works, that'll also help you to understand how Angular, React, and Ember work, right? They've all got the same guiding principles behind them. And if you focus on learning these guiding principles, the core concepts behind them, then that's going to help you shift between frameworks, which is almost certainly what you're going to have to do in your career. So Angular, Vue, and React, and Ember as well, I think, have these kind of shared concepts behind them. They're all written to build single page applications, or SPAs as the acronym goes. They're sort of there to manage data flow. Um, they're based on components, separate module components, imagining the state of the different bits of data and the, and the view or whatever. Um, you can build templates in Vue, no doubt you can do the same in Angular and React. And this binding thing between model and view, whether it's an MVC or MVVM, they're kind of tying the data to the model somehow, yeah? And often they offer this kind of routing stuff, which I'll explain with view towards the end, at the end of this lecture. So there's a bunch of shared concepts, you know, even Angular and um, Vue both have this kind of double moustache stuff, maybe React as well, I haven't tried React, but it has the same kind of thing, right? It's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking you're trying to, is common to all of these to some extent. Um, so I can't teach you the details of all the major frameworks, if I tried to do that, if I had like a week on Vue, a week on Angular, a week on React, you know, and some coursework on that, you know, great. Um, but I bet you'd forget, you're going to forget the details three weeks after the end of the course, right? It's completely pointless uh, trying to get all those details of major frameworks into your heads, okay? And, and also because this information rapidly goes out of date. I think we're on Vue version 2 or something at the moment. You know, maybe Vue version 4 will be the version that, you know, you, you encounter in, in industry, or maybe you're going to encounter a much earlier version, yeah? So going into the details of the frameworks is, is, is a waste of time, waste of your time. You know, that's not the purpose of an undergraduate computer science education, yeah? What I want to do here is explain one framework, view I've picked, uh, for reasons I'll explain, and I'm going to go into enough detail so you can use it in your project. So you get a feel for how these frameworks work, see the beauty of view, and when you've seen the beauty of view, you'll probably just naturally want to use it in everything you do, and that'll help you get the general principles, and then maybe you'll end up working in Angular, who knows. So I'm helping, trying to help you learn the core concepts that are implemented in other frameworks, rather than going through the details of all the major frameworks, which, as I said, is a waste of time, in my opinion. Okay, so I picked Vue, and I'll say a little bit about why. Um, it's lightweight, okay? Um, you don't need Webpack. You can do it all with Webpack, I think. I didn't bother. You just need a single JavaScript link, link to JavaScript file. It's really lightweight and easy to get started. So I think, as far as I understand, having watched some of these comparisons between frameworks videos on YouTube, um, you know, the, you sort of got the Angular and the React being built, and then Vue came along and tried to take the best bits of these kind of model view controller frameworks and make them and make the whole thing much more lightweight and simple and easy to use. So generally there's a good feeling about view. And another thing you'll see if you look at these uh, state of the web stuff is that although maybe Angular has, you know, three times more, you know, people actually actively developing it at the moment, view is actually gaining momentum. A lot more people are starting to use Vue, and so Vue usage is increasing significantly year by year. Yeah, so um, it's currently less popular, but that might be because it's coming on, it's a later sort of introduction, it's a f more recent framework, um, but a lot more, a lot of people are starting to use it because they're finding it such a nice, simple, easy framework to use. 
So it's increasing popularity, but I think it's probably still less popular than Angular, but who knows, in JavaScript Survey 2020 or something, no doubt Vue will be overtaking Angular or something like that. Who knows? Or maybe some other framework will come along. So it's got this minimalist small core, okay? Um, so it's got this sort of stuff that it does, which is really just the, the view model stuff, which is binding between the data and the view, between the model and the view. And then there's some other supported libraries, like the router library, um, which are also supported by Vue. So you get the complaint, I think it's React, has other third-party libraries, but they're not supported. So there's a little bit flaky in terms of their relationship with the main core. Whereas Vue has other modules, if you like, that plug into it um, that are actually supported by the, by the Vue development team. So as I said, it's really simple to get started, but it's got this powerful functionality for larger applications. And as you'll see from my example, I mean, it was just, it's just a dream come true in terms of how easy it is to link a web service to the data you actually see in the, in the browser. It's, it's, it's very nice and easy, um, and that's, what, that's why I like it. So a lot of these frameworks, uh, certainly Vue, um, but I think some of the other ones as well, are based on this idea of a virtual document object model. Um, so the document object model, as surely you know by now, is this tree-like data structure that corresponds to the structure of the HTML on the page. So the browser reads the HTML and builds this data structure in memory, yeah? And then with JavaScript, you can manipulate this data structure, and when you change the document object model, um, the browser updates the view um, that, the, that the user sees, you know? Um, so if you, you know, insert some text into the document object model, then the, then the user sees that text, yeah? So the document object model that's managed by the browser can contain like thousands of nodes, it's quite big, and it can be quite expensive to update after small changes. So if you just make a little change to it, then it's got to calculate all the relationships between the leaves on the trees and on the tree and all this kind of stuff. Um, and that can take a little bit of time and your browser can end up being a little bit sluggish, yeah? So to avoid this problem, what Vue and other frameworks do is use a virtual document object model um, to avoid the problem. So it seems slightly crazy that the browser uh, builds up this document object model and then Vue creates a copy of that document object model, but it seems to have good reasons for doing that, yeah? So, and that's just, so what the virtual document object model is, is the JavaScript model of the document object model. It kind of creates a copy of the document object model um, and then what Vue does is the client-side JavaScript, the Vue, the Vue JavaScript, makes changes to the virtual document object model, and then there's an algorithm behind, that works behind the scenes, identifying the changes that need to be made to the real document object model, and then it actually applies those changes in the most efficient way. So it's a way in which you can uh, have a much snappier interface because you're using this intermediate virtual document object model um, to calculate the best way of updating the real document object model. So this you know, the reason they're doing this is because it leads to higher performance and a better user experience. So it's really snappy and sharp, that's the idea. And you can also add additional functionality to the virtual document object model. So Vue has all this kind of data binding stuff, so presumably they're putting a lot of that functionality into the virtual document object model, um, and that, fu that functionality wouldn't exist in the original document object model built by the browser. So now I'm going to work through some introduction to a lot of the kind of basic stuff with Vue, yeah? Um, so I've also at the end um, provided a link to the Vue guide, which goes into this stuff in a lot more detail, and some very nice videos, um, which I'll give you a link to as well, um, which some of these examples are based on. So this is only a very quick survey of how you use Vue, and obviously you've got to go off and practice this stuff, yeah? So to use Vue, we just add a link to the Vue JavaScript library on your page, so that's dead easy. As I said, you can do it all with Webpack, but this is 10 times easier, yeah, if you're just doing for some fairly basic usage. And then what Vue does is it provides a binding between what you see, which appears in this uh, particular div. So you set up some divs, um, which is, and you specify that the Vue content is going between these divs, okay? And then you've got the Vue application, which has the data and the methods and all that kind of stuff for manipulating what appears in this in these div, yeah? So you credit to, to specify um, the view or view, so to speak. Um, we create some divs and give them a particular ID. It doesn't matter what the ID is, but app is good ID as any. And then we create a view application, um, a new view instance, and we pass in uh, an object that contains the data and methods for the app. And this object has several more keys than this, but the three sort of most important ones you're going to use the most are L, which is the element that you want to, to control the view of. That's this thing here. So we specify the ID of the HTML elements that are going to be controlled by the view application. We pass in a data object that contains the data that will be displayed in the view. This is like our model, you know, in this MVVM architecture. 
And then we've got methods. These are methods called by the view app. So, you know, the view might generate, might have some event handling in it, for example, and the event handling will call particular methods. And we pass in those, the code for those methods um, when we create the view application. So here's our sort of very basic app. Yeah. So here I told you about the HTML elements that, where the view content will appear. That's here. And then we create our app here. We create new views, so object oriented stuff, right? And we specify that the element that's going to be controlled by this application has the ID of app. This is a CSS selector stuff, right? Don't know if you can use other selectors. Probably not. Stick to the ID, it's safer. Um, and then, um, then we've got the data, right? This is the, uh, the model um, containing data that's going to appear here. And what we need to do, what we do in view, is we have a series of uh, what they call uh, directors, what they call directives, that's it. Um, we have a series of directors, directives um, that are used to control the way in which this data um, is, is presented in this view. Yeah? And we can make the data in different ways. Yeah, in this case, I'm just passing in you know, a JavaScript object here that I'm sort of creating on the fly like that. But we could also point, uh, you know, create our own object separately in the application um, and then pass and then point pass in you know that object there you know into our view application like that yeah so we can do it in either way and then if I change this object in my application if this is like in global scope wherever it was and then that would automatically change the object in there right because it's pointing to the same object so properties in the data object um, so the data object um, this thing here this thing here however you set it up um, the properties in this, in this case, have keys, right? So this key is message, and obviously we create a more complex uh, JavaScript object with lots and lots of different keys here. So when we set up the application, when we call this uh, constructor here on the new view application, uh, we're passing in a bunch of keys here. Um, and if these keys are, these keys, the data binding, the relationship between this data and this view only works for the keys that are passed in when you initialize the application. Yeah, so if there's some other keys that are added later to this data object, um, they won't be dynamically bound, they won't be bound um, to the view, to the to the view, to the view content here. So the whole, so the stuff passed into the data object um, is bound to the view so that when the data changes, the view changes. Yeah. But if you but these properties only work, they're only reactive if they exist when the data is created. That's the point I'm making here. So the whole, what view is doing at its core is this data binding business, yeah? And the binding is connecting the data with the view. Remember the view model stuff? That's what view is doing. It's re relating um, the data in, in the model um, with the view. And the most simple kind of data binding we can do is with these double curly braces, which are also used in Angular, right? This kind of this double curly brace like that, which are called double mustaches sometimes. And all you do is put the name of a piece of data inside here, and that corresponds to a key in the data object. And then at runtime, the key here that you put in curly braces is replaced with the value of the data in the data model uh, and updated whenever the data changes. So here we go. So if I put like message inside these curly braces here, and this is this this view uh, application is uh, linked to this particular view here. I think you can create multiple views, by the way. I think you can create lots of several applications on the page if you want. But anyway, this message here is a key in our data model. Um, so when at runtime, this will be replaced with uh, hello view, right? So let's have a little demo. I can show you that in the browser. So here we have demo one. Okay, so easy enough, right? The data model's here. So if we do, let's just see this. So we can manipulate all this using the console, right? So if we do console.log uh, json uh, string if I. Uh, maybe it's not the best approach, but app dot message. In fact, why, why am I string following that? It doesn't really matter anyway. Uh, okay, so if we actually just do forget about the stringify business, I might use that later. But we do console.log app message. So in this case, app is our view application, right? And message is this data piece of data in the key um, within our view application. Yeah. So we can see that the current value of message in our application is hello view. And if we do app.message, uh, change it, right? Which you can do on the console to goodbye view. Uh, then you can see we change it in the data and immediately the changes appear in the view, yeah? So we're changing the model 
and we're changing the view and because it, and that works because we've got this setup this binding between model and view So the moustache is a good, useful sometimes, um, but a lot of the functionality of view is based around this idea of directives. And they give us much more rich functionality for man manipulating the bound data in different ways. And we place these directives inside the HTML elements inside the view, yeah? So they're kind of like HTML attributes, these directives. <coughs> Excuse me. And typically start with V, although there's a couple of shortcuts that I'll show you. So V text, Directive, as they're called, um, is the same as the double moustaches. Um, it's just a sort of, you know, a different way of doing it with the, the actual directive thing without the double moustache thing. And all we do here, so you can see here, vText is an attribute in the div tag like this. Okay, so we say vText equals message. So in this case, we're saying that the text inside this element here um, will contain the value um, of the data that has the key message. So in this, relating to our previous example, message here. Uh, the hello view here will be stuck uh, in, inside this div element here. That's what we're doing there. Uh, yep. Now, if we had data containing HTML tags, um, then that would create problems. So we, instead we use vHTML. If we want to put, so if we just want plain text to go in there, we use the vText uh, directive. If we want to put HTML in these tags, uh, like, you know, this h1 stuff, um, then we need to use the vHTML directive. And then that will actually interpret the HTML so the user won't see the H1s, the user will see the, you know, the formatting provided by the H1 tags, yeah? And then we have vBind. So what we might also want to do with our HTML is instead of putting data in between the tags, we might want to change the attributes of the tags themselves. And that's what the vBind is, is doing here. So if we want to change, for example, an image has a source attribute, um, and what we can do is use vBind and then give the attribute name, um, to set the source attribute of an image tag, for example. So I'll, I'll show you what this means, probably easier. Um, and vBind is often sh you, uh, given the shortcut just a colon. So because it's such a common thing people use in uh, Vue, um, we often have a sort of shortcut where we get rid of the vBind and just provide the colon and the attribute name. So it's probably easier showing with an example here. So here we've got our application. Inside our application, we've got a, a key image source pointing to you know, the source of an image here. And then here we've got an image tag. And instead of saying source equals whatever, we're doing we're doing this v bind thing, so that the source here is then bound um, to this piece of data here. Okay, so the source of the image becomes this piece of data here. So if we change that in our model, um, we would instantly change that in our view. And this is and if we wanted to just do the shortcut, we can just do colon source. So if we just had without the colon, it wouldn't be interpreted by view at all. We'd just get this static image source, which wouldn't be, and uh, the browser wouldn't know what to do with this. It wouldn't be able to find this file called image source. But because we bound it with view, this is like view syntax. Um, then we're linking that. It's going to look up, uh, look in our data structure for a key image source and replace this um, with this string here. Okay. And we can do that as well. So it's app image source, just to remind myself. So now if you go to our second demo, we can do a similar thing to what we did in the first example. I think it's demo two, isn't it? Is this demo two? Nope, it's probably demo three. Oh yeah, that was the HTML example. Right, okay, so here we have our page uh, in which the image source is cat1, I think it is. And so again, we can do console.log uh, app dot image source, right? Uh, and that says image source in our data structure is currently set to images cat1 JPEG. And just like the previous example, if we change the data structure, app dot image source equals uh, images uh, cat2 JPEG, um, then we're instantly changing what we see there. Yeah, because the attribute of the image tag has been changed is bound to this this key here, image source. If we change that in the data structure, we change that we change what's loaded in the view. And look, and look at it, it's pretty pretty quick as well, isn't it? The way it reacts to all that. Another very useful directive, which I'm going to come to in my later example, is the v4 directive, and that enables us to loop through an array of data. So in our model, we might have an array of elements here. And we might want to put in a set of HTML tags for each item. And we can do this using the v4 directive. So again, so same kind of idea. So here we have products. 
have an array here with like, uh, you know, ID one, name, Apple, pair, next string, whatever, some data about a particular set of products. And then we can use the v4 loop to work through the products. So here we have products, which is like a temporary name for one of these rows here. And then products is the array, the, the key um, of the array in the data structure. So we're working through products, and for each iteration of the loop, it's going to assign one of these things to product. And then we're using the double moustache here um, to access the idea of the product, the name of the product, and the price of the product. And this, so this v4 loop will just work through all the products and output that for each row in the array. Yeah. And so here we have, uh, here we can see it in the browser. And we'll do a little demo here, showing the same idea. I hope this isn't too ridiculously obvious. Uh, um, Okay, so if we go to the browser here, so here's my, firstly, let's let's look at this array, yeah? So console.log, I think we will have to stringify it this time, stringify uh, app dot, was it products? Okay, ah, let's forget that. Okay, so that's what we've got in our data structure at the moment. We've got one, two, three products, apple, the pear, and the nectarine. And the v4 directive is looping through those products there, yeah? Now, if we add a product to this, um, we can do app.products.push and give it new products. So let's give it ID you know, 7, uh, oh, name. Uh, let's choose uh, pineapple. I haven't got pineapple right, yeah. And price, I don't know, 20, 20 pounds expensive pineapple. So we're going to push a new product onto the end of the array, okay? And the moment we do that, we're changing the data structure, and then view, because it's bound, the data and the view are bound together, view will instantly update the view, yeah? So you can see here, when I've changed the data structure, view has immediately, you know, worked through the for loop again and updated the view there, yeah? So it's very nice, very quick changes. It's simple, you know, the moment we change the data structure, we're also changing the view because of the binding between them. Then we've got v model directive, um, and this is where we're connecting user input to data in the model. Um, so it's uh, you know like we're using like input fields and stuff like that. So here we've got an input field, uh, like a text input field, and we're saying v model message. So what we're saying here is that whatever goes into this input field here um, is immediately copied into the model here with, uh, with the key that message. So we're saying that whatever someone types in here gets copied into here, okay? And then here at the top of here, um, we've got the binding between the message and, and the data here. So we're gonna type something in here, it's gonna update this data here. And then also, when this data here changes, um, this is gonna be updated here. So as we type in here, we're gonna see what we're typing in here, and it's also gonna be updating it down here. So that's uh, so the same idea. We go into demo five. So here, hello from view. So just to see what it does here. So if we just type my name in here, for example. Um, so my name appears in the model. So if we do console log uh, app dot uh, message, okay. So in the model, when I've typed in David, it's outputting David. If I type in, you know, John, um, then do the same thing here. Then we've got John in the model, yeah? We can change it in the model. Uh, uh, Judy, whatever. So if we change the model, then we're gonna change the view, right? Um, so we get Judy coming up here and also in the input field here. And obviously if we change, uh, because of this binding here between this input field and here, whatever we type in here is also changing the model. View also gives us event handling, so that when things change um, in response to user input, we can then specify what, how we want that to affect our model, yeah? And we, we do this using the v on directive, and then we specify the event after a colon, um, and specify the method that we want to be called um, when the event is triggered, yeah? So if we want to handle a click event, for example, we use v on click, and then we spec uh, point, say that should equal log message, for example, and log message is one of the methods that we pass into the view application when we create it, yeah? And often v on colon click is abbreviated at click. So the colon, colon abbreviation is when you're setting HTML attributes 
and the at abbreviation is when you're setting um, setting up event handling. So this is the click event, we'll call log message, and log message is the method we actually want to call. Yeah. And these methods that we want to call are specified in the methods section of the struc data structure that we're passing into the view application. So in this case, we're calling log message. I think it is. Well, it's a slightly like different one, but. Um, so in our methods here, we have like a bunch of functions, and this is log name is the key, and the value is this function, which is just logging out this dot name. So we can access different. It's like this uh, object-oriented JavaScript stuff, right? We can do if we call this dot name, then we can pull out um, th this this piece of data here. Yeah. So I'll show you a little example. So we've got button, and we've got v on click. We're setting up the click event handling for this button, and it's going to call log name when the when the event's triggered. So it's going to call this function here when the event's triggered, and we can abbreviate that to the at click function here. So if we do at click, the click on the button, it's going to call this function and output the name um, that is in this input field here. Yeah? And this input field here uh, is like bound to the name. Yeah, that's right. So whatever we type in here um, is then bound to the name, and then it's going to log it out on the console when we click the button. That's what it's going to do. Yeah. Okay, so let's just uh, do that demo. Okay, so check the name here. Uh, hello there. Okay, and click submit, and so that that event triggers uh, the function, the method, and the method. All the method's doing is name is hello there, which is what whatever's in the input field, because this input field is bound to the model. So actually, I think if we type in David, um, and then we do console.log uh, app name is that going to give us david yes yeah, so whatever we type in here is bound to the model anyway all we're doing with the event handling is just outputting the same thing yeah so uh jules let's say yeah so it's be the same thing here right so jules so this this is already being bound to the model all the event handling is doing is calling the console logging bit okay so that's a, a very brief um introduction to the kinds of things you can do with view and view directives um, before I go on to the sort of example, uh, sort of fully fledged example of using a web server with view, I just want to introduce Axios, which is this handy little library uh, for doing the XML HTTP requests. Um, for, so it's a handy library for communicating between JavaScript code running in the browser and, uh, and the server. So last year, I um, introduced Ajax to you, right, where you could use uh, XML HTTP requests um, uh, within the browser to pull extra data from the web service running in the server, for example. It's a bit cumbersome to type. For some reason, you guys seem to hate these XML HTTP requests. It's not amazingly elegant. Um, so a lot of you ended up using the jQuery libraries for this. But if you're not using jQuery, um, then yeah, maybe you know Axios is a good thing to think about as a nice alternative to jQuery. I'm not saying you should use any. You're welcome to use XML HTTP requests, but uh, Axios seems to be a little bit of a better choice. So what Axios is, it's a library for sending HTTP requests uh, from the browser or from the server. So you can use it server-side um, to uh, pull stuff from other websites. So maybe next time we'll use it for um, pulling, accessing data from web services, I haven't decided yet. Um, on the client side, um, you can use it for pulling data from the same domain that the JavaScript's been, uh, the scripts come from. Um, it will probably fail on cross-origin requests in the browser. So I haven't tested it. In this sort of video tutorial I was watching on Vue, some guy was using it to do sort of postcode lookup or something like that, and that seemed to work. Okay, I don't know why it worked, but it seemed to work. So I haven't tested it, so it might work across origin requests on the browser, but the, even the Axios web page suggests that it won't. So it'll probably fail on cross origin requests in the browser. It should succeed from cross, with cross origin requests on the server. There's the website there. So I'm going to use Axios um, as an alternative to the XML HTTP request. Um, to pull data from my serials RESTful web service that I introduced in the previous lecture. And it's based on promises, by the way. So if you remember lecture 10, where we're talking about Java callback issues in JavaScript, so promises enable you to sequence events, um, and, and Axios uses this kind of then notation, which is com comes from this promise stuff. So if you remember my serials RESTful web service, if we send a get, um, to that uh, URL, then it returns data about all the serials in JSON format, sort of ignoring, oh yeah, but that's without the pagination anyway. So that was my RESTful web service for accessing the serials. And here's a little example that will show you how it does exactly the same thing, yeah? So here's the source, so we just include like the Axios library from the distribution there. 
And all I'm doing here is I'm calling the load serials function when the window and load event is triggered. Load serials function is more elegant than the XML HD request. All we do is axios.get. We'll call a get method. We'll send a get request um, to this URL, obviously with the rest of the domain included. And here's the promise stuff, right? So we're going to send a get request, and then after when the uh, this is the callback function that's called um, after it's done that. So it's going to do that first. Then it's going to the callback function we'll call is here. So the response has come back and then we can do whatever we want with the response. In this case, what I'm doing is saying data received from web service and then just stringifying the response. If there was some kind of error, um, you know, we didn't get the appropriate thing back, it wasn't a 200 message, 200 status code coming back, something like that, then we're going to catch, then we can catch the function and no doubt, then this, this is what's called in the case of an error, and then we can like log it out or handle it in some other way, yeah. So that's all I'm doing here with this uh, little example. So let's just do that now. So here's my web service that I introduced in the previous lecture. Uh, you know, so we go there, we see all the stuff in JSON format. And then I actually want to go to localhost. I think it's, uh, maybe it's gonna go there. Yes, I think that's it, okay. So here we go, the Axios demo, that code I just showed you. It's not got any visualization stuff yet. Um, all it's doing is logging to the console, data received from web service, and this is the uh, stringified version of that data there. So it's kind of working right, so it's talking to this web service here and just pulling back the data so we can use it in JavaScript. This is like the intermediate step we need to do if we're setting up view with um, view with the web service. Right, so I've shown you how view, how we can set up the bindings between the model and the view, uh, with view. Um, I've shown you how Axios can pull the data from the web service in a very nice, clean and simple way. Now I can put the two things together and show you how I can use Vue with a web service. And, you know, this is, you know, quite nice. It works really well, I think. So a nice simple example illustrates how easy it is to use Vue to display data from a RESTful web service. So the web service code, uh, as I mentioned, is almost identical to the one presented in lecture 10. I think I had to make a couple of tweaks. Um, and then what Axios does is it gets the data, it puts that data into the model, uh, into Vue's model, and then Vue will recognize that the model's changed and then automatically refresh and, dis or dis and display that data. And as usual, the example code's available online. So here we go. So, if, so the app is actually remarkably simple, um, and that's what I like about it, yeah? So we've got this much code here, um, plus, uh, plus this little bit of HTML here with the view, with the view directories. It's not, not a complicated. So first we've got the, the data structure, right? Um, which in this case is pointing on an empty array. So the plan is we're going to fetch the serials data and put it into this array here. And then, and then we're going to write some stuff so that Vue can actually uh, display that serials data in the browser. Then we've got a method called load all serials, um, which would do the, was exactly the same as the previous section, right? We're just calling app to get serials. And then we're setting serials um, to the response data that we get back from the web page. And then we got this, this is this here, I haven't explained yet. I'm not going to explain in any detail, but what this is called a lifecycle hook. So, when, so Vue has various stages as it builds, builds up, it builds up its web application. You know, when you do that new Vue stuff, it's building the web application, set everything, setting everything up with the data bindings, and it can trigger a series of events, or called lifecycle hooks, and these events can be, you can hook into these lifecycle hooks, so to speak, and call particular functions at different stages of the view initialization process. And this is called when the data is loaded. And so when the view is in the appropriate state, we can then call our own function, load all serials um, from this view lifecycle hook. It's a bit like window and load, um, but it's, uh, you know, within the view context, yeah? Okay, so that's the data I've explained already, really. So data structure is pointing to an empty array. We've got a key serials and an empty array here. And then we've got load all serials. So what this is doing is, uh, this is slightly messy here. Um, there's some issue with scope. Uh, so, which is, for some reason, we can't just use this in here. I think probably because this is pointing to this local scope rather than, don't know, anyway. For, for whatever reason, uh, we need to create a copy of this, which is like the global, the sort of scope of the view application. And we're gonna call that local app, okay? Um, so that we can, and that's what we're doing here, so that we, then we can change the serials data structure here, yeah? So we've got the serials data structure here um, within our view app, and we need to do this bit of fudgery here 
um, because of some scope complexities. And so that in effect, this is our view scope here and the serials within the data structure of the view application, yeah? So when we get the serials back from the web service, we get response.data, and then this has the serials array containing all the serials. So what we're doing here is we're setting the serials array in our view app um, to the data that comes back from the web service. And this one line of code is all we need to update everything, really, and that's what's so nice about this, yeah? And the rest is just, you know, a bit of logging and a bit of event handling, a bit of error handling. And then we got this view lifecycle hook. And what that's doing is just calling this method load all serials, this thing here, once, okay, to load up the data initially, and then it's refreshing it every five seconds. So it's gonna be pinging the web service every five seconds. It's slightly inelegant, right? Might be slightly better to do it with web sockets, um, but this is kind of okay, right? Every five seconds, we're not killing ourselves with that, yeah? So we're loading, calling the load all serials method every 5,000 seconds, every, every five seconds, 5,000 milliseconds, um, and that's it, when, and it's just setting that up at a, when it's initialized in the view application. And the HTML is trivial, right? We've got the app where our view data is displayed, and we've got a header, and then a v4 loop is working through our serials, which is in our data structure, and a ser for each of these, each of the rows in this array, it's going to copy each of those into here, and then output the ID, the name, the weight, and the price. So very, very simple for loop, right? That's just a v4 directory. The server's almost identical to the example from lecture 10. I just changed the name of this array from serials from data to serials, because otherwise you've got data.data .data and it all gets confusing. So I changed the array to serials. Um, and I added express to serve static files from a folder called public. So I can serve up my front end file um, to, you know, to do this display stuff. Okay, so let's have a little demo, yeah? I hope I've made it clear what's going on here. Okay, that's the Axios demo. And then if we go, just to there, to the root. Right, so here we have uh, serials and then the v4 directive. So this data is all pulled from the web service using that very simple code. Um, and it's just working through this stuff that's pulled from the web service and writing it out to the page here. And if you look here, this is changing every five seconds down here. Yeah, so it's three, four. So it's this is the timer interval that's pinging the web service every five, every five seconds to, to keep the data up to date, yeah? And this is what you might want to do with your price comparison websites. So here is my, in Heidi SQL, I've got the data here. So if you look at here, the, the price, the serial with ID 16 has a price of 100 at the moment, yeah? So here we've got a price of 100, right? Now, if we change it in the database here, we change it to, I don't know, 99, something like that, yeah? We commit it there and go back to our web page. Um, so you can see that's now changed to 99, right? So with almost no effort, right, we've linked up our database with our front end um, in this very nice, clean way. Yeah? And uh, I have to say, I was quite impressed when I got this working because it was like, wow, you know, the wow factor is we've got this bit of HTML and not a lot of code, right? That much code. And suddenly we have the front end, you know, connected dynamically sort of bound to the data in the database effectively via view and a web service. It's pretty nice stuff. Okay, so I've done the demo. Okay, so final thing I want us to talk about, just very briefly, um, is this routing stuff, um, because it's kind of a, it seems to be quite, you know, popular. I think React has this routing stuff, maybe Angular has this routing stuff. So I thought I'd very briefly talk you through how a view handles routing. This is in no way a kind of comprehensive or particularly good example, but I just want to introduce it to you so you can think about using this kind of approach when you're setting up the different pages in your web application. So with a sort of traditional routing, which you're more used to, right, you click on a link uh, in the browser, like an anchor tag, that sends an HTTP request off to the server. The server generates uh, a bit of HTML from a database or loads it up from a file and then it sends it back to the client which then displays it in the page. Yeah? But with a single page web application we're more likely to just want to replace part of the HTML on the page um, and to do that you often have this kind of client side routing. Yeah? So the HTML for the different pages are already on the client and just by clicking on the different links um, you load up these different chunks of HTML, these different chunks of HTML added to the document object model. It might be some part of the page that's reloaded, or it might be the entire page that's, re that's sort of changed in, resp in response to user actions. So this is a sort of single page web application approach. So Vue has its own routing library, uh, Vue Router, 
and it makes it pretty easy to set up different pages in this single page web app. So I mean, but recommend you really go to the documentation of this because this isn't a particularly good example. I'm just going to introduce it to you to explain how it works. So because the view routing library is like a separate module within view, we need to have a separate link to the JavaScript file for it. And then here's my little demo. So within my HTML, within my app HTML, I've got uh, the actual links. So I might have this in several different parts of the page. So these, this is what the user actually sees and interacts with here. So when they click on home, they're going to go home. When they click on this, this text here, page two, they're going to go to page two. And then when, what they, the, the HTML that's loaded in response to these user actions, that's what appears up here. Okay, that appears in this router view. And then this is the code that actually sets up the router here. Yeah? So what we do is we define the HTML that's going to appear on each page. So we have what's called these templates. So here I'm setting up these templates using just some, you know, bit of like a string, right? But I think there's a way of setting up templates. I haven't tried it myself, but there's a way of setting up templates in separate files within view. But, you know, I'm not doing that here. Just a very simple example. So we've got basically a key template and the value bit of HTML that appears when the user clicks on a particular link. Okay, and this is for page one, and this is for page two. Then we create a router. And this has an array of routes, yeah? So this is the path. So when the, when the path on the server is like slash, um, it'll load up uh, the component page one, this HTML here. And when the path is page two, it'll click on page two. So there's two components to the router, right? We've got the um, user um, changing the URL, and that's what this is handling here. And we've got the user clicking on links, um, which is what we're handling here. So we need to handle both things if you're going to do routing correctly. Otherwise, if the user goes to that page manually, um, you won't see the appropriate HTML for page two. So we need to do both things there. And then we do this sort of slightly revised way of setting up the view app. Uh, no doubt we can put all the other stuff in there as well, um, but this is just simply, it's just a routing example. So we create the new app, and here we're specifying that the router is my router, this thing we've actually set up here, yeah. And then we have this mount business um, into the app div. So, you know, the slight, slightly different syntax from the, um, from the basic example I gave you in a couple of sections back. So let's just have a little look at this running. Um, so here we go to the uh, router demo. Now where do I put that? I think that's here. I think that's uh, router demo. There we go. So if we go to router demo slash, and I think if we go to page, if we, with a bit of luck, I'm not guaranteeing this will work, we get to page two, right? So we've got the two pages. We've got home. When we click on home, we see the, the HTML with home page. That's what we had. Uh, here, right, that's the HTML there, home page, and the one's page two. Uh, not that, which demo, okay, so click on home, we see the HTML for home page, click on page two, we see the HTML for page two. But also, if we manipulate it up here, then we see the home page HTML and the page two HTML. As I said, you need to set it up in two ways. We could have set it up so page two displays a different bit of HTML, whatever, yeah? So, you know, that's what that's doing. And we've set up our routes in our single page web app. Um, not very amazing or pretty. I'm just trying to illustrate the basic idea so that if you did want to do your uh, front end this way, then, you know, that's sort of, this is a good way of doing it. It's only been a very brief introduction to Vue, I know, like an hour or so. Vue's got a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, it's a big framework. It's got a lot of powerful features. Um, you know, you can, watching data is really nice. So when it, when the, you can trigger functions or methods um, when the data changes. Computed properties sort of optimization thing when you've got things that you calculate it once and just use lots of times. Not quite sure what dependency injection is, but I think it's similar to Java dependency injection. So you can, you, I've shown you a few of the view directories like V on, uh, V4, this kind of stuff, V model, um, but you can write your own. Um, View's got this sort of modular, reusable component architecture. So you can, again, you can, um, I'm not, yeah, sort of build your own components, I think, and use them in different ways. I briefly introduced one of the lifecycle hooks, but as Vue initializes itself, you can hook into other sort of, you know, maybe the destroy bit of the lifecycle it finds useful. So if you look in the Vue guide, it's got some really nice documentation view. So um, I recommend you have a look through that. Vue also has a Chrome extension and a Firefox add-on. So they give you developer tools that are customized for Vue, so you can inspect Vue components, similar way to standard web developer tools. You just install it through Chrome and Firefox. So it should look like this. Um, we click on the view part of the Chrome developer tools, and then you can see um, the parts of view. I had some issue where for some reason it stopped working, so I didn't bother doing a demo, but you know, it seemed to work fairly well when I have used it from time to time. So you might find this a useful way of inspecting the different view, view components and, and seeing what's going on with them. 
So there are no marks for using Vue in Coursework 1, right? So if you use Vue, I'm not going to give you five marks for Vue, yeah? Because you obviously might not want to use Vue, right? You might prefer to use Angular or React or something like that, yeah? But there are marks uh, for front-end functionality that I think is pretty easy to implement in Vue. So I think I made a pretty good case for using Vue with a web service to dynamically display the data from the database, yeah? So if you're going to use a REST API, there's probably a good, good case to be made for using Vue or a similar framework um, for updating the view of the data based upon, you know, um, data pull from the REST API. And obviously for implementing all this stuff, um, I think you'll find Vue to be a pretty good choice, right? It's, it's an easy way of changing the model, and you could use a watch or whatever to then ping a different kind of search off to the server, and then use that to change the product display, for example. Probably won't help you much with the attractive side of the website, but it won't help you at all, actually. It will help you with ease of use. It's easy to set up the functionality in a way, in the right way, without doing enormous amounts of effort, so you don't get lazy with how you actually try and make it as easy to use as possible. Here with the sources, as usual, got the recorded lecture, the slides, um, and then we got the um, two, so two sets of example code. One is the, I have this sort of demo one, demo two stuff that's all wrapped up in there. And then we got the view with the web service example code. Um, I put it in that zip file there. Now these are really nice set of, of video tutorials. So, so obviously got all the usual stuff, you know, a few links on view, the guide, the website, Axios and that. But I did find these video tutorials very useful uh, when I was learning about you know, the basics of Vue. Yeah? So I recommend you have a little look at this, uh, this link here. He's got some very nice uh, simple explanations with code demos about the different aspects of Vue. So some of the examples in this uh, lecture were actually drawn from that set of tutorials and I, I recommend them, they're, they're good. Okay, so this lecture has introduced Vue. Um, it's the last lecture in the awesome term and the next lecture is gonna introduce you to coursework too. That'd be the start of the spring term.